I'm pressing buttons. Woo! Oh, we just disappeared. Woo! Oh, wow, we're in an interdimensional galaxy wow. today. Wow. Hey, there's no zoom in on us. There's no zoom in on us. But there's a there's a zoom away. There should be. There well should and is is two different things. Uh, you the show you, you everything up. Uh oh, did I fuck it up? No, the people that realize tonight are idiots. Well, I think you should shit can Oh God! You can't <laughs> fire people you don't pay. We're all Welcome volunteers. to Modern Art Blitz. That camera is supposed to be zoomed in on Lisa and I. It is. Uh, is it? Watch, camera. Oh, there we there are. There it was. Well, there we go. Woo! Hi, I'm Mac Leeson, your host. This is Lisa Derek, my lovely co-host. Hi. Well, we've already had a few technical difficulties that have cost us valuable time to talk to some great people at the art world. So without further ado, I will introduce our first guest. This is our first returning guest on the show. He's also co-hosted when I wasn't in town. He's done a lot for the show. He's done a lot for the art scene of Los Angeles. He's a great artist, and his name is Abel Alejandre. Abel Alejandre, give it up. Woo! Hey! I hope at home you're, you're, you're here. Sit here, sit here, sit here. Sit in the sit hot here. seat. And you can look straight into that camera and say... Here's Whatever you art. want. There Hello. you are. <clears throat> Good to be back. All right. So, Abel, um, we're looking there at some hats of yours uh, from your current show at my gallery, which is called Coagula Curatorial. And there's some there's a hat. There's an alien in the middle. You were covering up the alien. Tell us about what what's going on with these hats. They're my conspiracy hats. Uh, I made ten of them. And this, these are five of the ten. And uh, I just wanted to take. Uh, popular conspiracies that um, I, I found entertaining and interesting. And so... Um, the Loch Ness Monster? Is that... <laughs> yeah. And the, then what's next to that one? Uh, that's the fake moon landing. Okay. And then the... Uh, aliens. The aliens, you know. Tupac. What's up with Tupac? Why is he Tupac. a conspiracy? <laughs> well, there were people who said that he really hadn't um, died and that he was, he was going to come back in 2015. Oh. And so... Um, interesting. And also there's the conspiracy that he may have been murdered yeah. through a vast level. Well, we know he was murdered. There's well, I know, but like there was a conspiracy, no conspiracy to murder him that was based in the okay. rap wars. Okay, and then what's the far one on the, on the far one there? There's the um, Bigfoot. Bigfoot, ah, the legendary Sasquatch, yes. Well, I've, I've, seen, uh, I've seen him at a couple of Starbucks recently. Um, so, so what is the obsession with conspiracy theories? Well, the... Um, for for me, I, I I started this series mostly because um, something a, a conversation that I would have with my mother, you know, like from the time I was a child, and she she would tell me that, that there was a little bird that that told her my secrets, and so you know I always understood that there was a snitch in the neighborhood, <laughs> and so someone that was like watching, and so I always was like suspicious of people, and you know, and suspicious of of anything and what what would be behind it, and so. I thought about this and, and you know, and it just tried to extend it to his logical conclusion and just, just start opening up to um, hearing some of the, the, the conspiracies, not, not so much accepting, but just like hearing what, what they were about instead of just uh, outright rejecting them. What's the, what's the conspiracy we're looking at here? <clears throat> well, this is a, um, a, a witch doctor, a shaman uh, in, in Africa uh, doing a, a sort of exorcism 
to get rid of Ebola. And so what, would ha what happened is that when the, the WHO doctors went to, you know, to help out with the Ebola-stricken people, they would have these protective um, garments to, you know, so they wouldn't get infected. So what the shaman did, they basically took um, um, cloth and, and foam and basically recreated this costume so they could use it in the ceremony. So the, so the surgeons could actually get Western medicine to kind of work? Okay, thanks. <laughs> and then, uh, and, and now, this is a conspiracy of, of sombreros as alien <laughs> ships? Well, the, I was working on this piece, and uh, this uh, actually is my father, and um, I went to go visit him, and when I was visiting him, he starts ranting about how UFOs, you know, uh, have taken over, and, you know, how, you know, uh, iPhones are really like alien technology. And, and so, and so when I went back to the, the studio, oh. I turned his sombrero oh. into, <laughs> into a UFO. <laughs> wow. Okay, so the, see, these are pretty tight renderings. How do you, how do you render so tightly? Well, these are my, um, my paintings. And I, I, I started out as a painter. And so instead of using a paintbrush, I'm using paint markers. And so these are acrylic paintings. Oh, wow. So who's climbing up the rope there? Uh, that is an uh, artist friend, uh, Samantha Fields. She uh, agreed to uh, sit for me or, you know, stand for me in this case. And, um, and so I have her, like, poking the sky for these uh, magic pills that represent, you know, uh, <clears throat> basically drugs and how um, we, we here, you know, especially like, you know, in, in North America, don't want to accept that you know that there, there may be a cost for acquiring these drugs, so it creates a lot a of social havoc. cost. Yeah, it creates a lot of havoc. That's just else. other countries. <laughs> so it's, it, it, it's almost like Jack and the Beanstalk. And who's this behind us? This is a uh, a gentleman I met here uh, in in the uh, in the, uh, the uh, green screen. Um, his name is Eric, and uh, I, I I was he just had a, such a, a striking feat features and I asked him if he would come to my studio and uh, and uh, and post for me. Oh cool. And cool. so I, I gave him antennas and uh, as if he were an alien and so I was thinking about you know when people say you know the aliens walk amongst us I thought well you know what if they did what, what would they look like you know uh, what would be uh, what could I expect? They would wear New England Patriots hats. New, well they, you know they need to blend in. <laughs> <laughs> and so in this case I have Another artist, uh, his name is uh, Mario Ibarra. Wow. And so I thought, you know, in his case, he would have his antennas underneath the, the hat. Ah, uh, stashed. Stashed. Hey, here's more hats. There's more conspiracies? Or is this, we're the, back to? We're, we're back, back to, to the, the first ones. The first ones. How did that happen? Jeez. And now, wait, we're just going, what happened to all the, you don't have any Metro pictures here, do you? Oh, it's another pit folder. Oh. Wow, technology is so fascinating. Yeah, we're just, we're, we're having a tech, we, we normally do the show on Sunday, and on Sunday the Lord blesses us with no technical difficulties, and so now we're doing it on a Thursday. Well, it's also Mars retrograde now. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's Mars retrograde, Pluto retrograde, and I believe Mercury retrograde all at once. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> behind us is a panel, correct? Yes. From your upcoming Metro project. Yeah, this, <coughs> this is a, one of 12 panels that I did for the, uh, my Metro station, which is the, the Rancho Park, um, Westwood Rancho Park station. And this is going to be uh, opening at the end of May. Uh, May 20th is May 20th. the official opening. And so um, what's going on with this? It's a bunch of kids. Well, I... I wanted to do, um, my, my concept was to, to do a, a panorama of would-be commuters, but from the vantage point of a child rather than, you know, uh, adults. Oh, so that's why we're getting the, the knees there. The yeah, knees so there this, are, are all kind of um, this way like I could a kid have, would see it that way, yeah? Yeah. So this way I could avoid, you know, not having, a, or, or not having enough of any one group. So, you know, so if, if you have, so, you know, there were different people that have lived there, you know, from, from the Native Americans to the Spaniards to the Mexicans to the Armenians and, you know, Japanese Americans. 
And so to have the right mix and to please everybody, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with that, but I wanted to, you know, um, still have uh, something interesting to look at. It looks like that guy's uh, litigating there with the, with the, the crutches, and right? MTA didn't mind that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well the, there was a, a soldier's home uh, nearby, and so this is a reference to that soldier's uh, okay. home. Okay, so it, this is truly a, a, some public art going on. Well, I, I, wanted, I wanted to do my best to, well, uh, to, to include the community and, and still have my my uh, my trademark uh, style and your birds <laughs> and my birds yeah i saw a hummingbird and that looks like a mockingbird is there is there uh is there a, a cost to actually go to the station well just the the um the price of of getting on the train but you can actually see the what, what's the, the panels. fine what's the fine for not having a ticket i have no idea <laughs> are, are we going to find out on may 20th i think i'll buy i'll load up my tap card and go Hey, well, we, on May 20th, it's free. Well, in that for, case, for no that one has an extension, excuse. For that extension of the... Uh, for the extension of the... The expo line. The expo line. We, we have to do this as a field trip, Matt. You know, I have an idea. We'll do it as a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so and, and so this is all from the... Oh, wait. This is all from the kids' perspective. Yeah. So, so uh, how is working with Metro? You know, I, I have to say that for me, it, it was easy peasy. I, I heard people complain that, you know, like that it was difficult because, you know, there was so much bureaucracy and red tape, but that wasn't the case for me. I mean, if, if there was, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't see it. Now, how long is a drawing supposed to last uh, in, a, in a train station? Well, these, the, um, they're basically uh, manufactured into steel enamel plates, and oh. uh, you know, and so um, a good fifty years. Uh, I mean, it's supposed to last forever, but uh, the you know the the, the fabrication is forever. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fabrication is pretty solid. Wow. Okay. So these are, these are not drawing. These are based on some drawings you did. Yeah. But these are on steel enamel. Yeah, steel enamel uh, wow. okay. tiles. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. So they'll be they'll be. They'll be around uh, probably a lot longer than all of us, uh, and Metro uh, Metro is happy with uh, everything, and you are happy with working with them. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, probably. well, okay. So, um, so when you're on the Expo line, obviously you're going to be seeing at the Westwood, Westwood Rancho Park, the Westwood Rancho Park station, and then every station has art. Right. So there's seven stations, so, and uh, mine is just one of seven. Okay. So, um, and then your shows at at uh, Coagula, Coagula with with the, with the conspiracy theories. Right. And um, my gallery, Coagula, Coagula Curatorial. And so, so you're just, this is like taking a break for you, right? To just come here and talk, right? Instead oh, of, we're going to put him to work, though. We're going to put him in the Skechers seat. Well, I think we should put you in the Skechers seat for our next guest, who's, if anybody in L.A. is worthy of having a portrait sketched, <clears throat> this longtime servant to art must be. But the problem is, um, she's going to need a microphone. And you're, oh, it works. The, the, the other, okay, go get your sketching gear, Abel. <laughs> We're going to put you in the sketcher's seat. And while you're doing that, I'm going to introduce our next guest. If I were to start reciting this guest's, blah, blah, this guest's resume, we do not have enough time. It would take too long. She's contributed to every periodical of note in the 20th and 21st century. She is the primary wordsmith if you want an article about your art to actually be readable a year from now and not sound like every other article you ever wrote. So this is the de facto voice of the Los Angeles art scene. Wow. Has been for decades and hopefully will be with us much longer because we all are richer for her having been here. Ladies and gentlemen, Shayna Nice Dambrot. Wow. Hey, you guys. Hey, hey. Welcome, welcome. I'm excited to have that you on the show. Amazing. So, and here comes uh, the sketcher. Abel is going to be sketching you while we chat. So, okay. Now you could look into that camera, even though I'll, I'll be listening to you. Yeah. You don't have to. So, no. You know. Well, I mean, I'm easily distracted. So between oh, there's a lot the going monitor on delay and oh, yeah. Abel and oh, you yeah. and this. <laughs> green but it's not green on, on i know on but in, TV. in here it's incredible yeah 
um, you know, if I, I might be looking around a little bit. So, Apologies so, so let's There's start off. Let's at. start off. This picture to me kind of sums up Shana. What are you doing there? <laughs> okay. So that was me taking a little spin in Kenny Sharp's tricked out um, golf cart when it was included in um, one of Greg Escalante's earliest shows, introducing himself to the Chinatown uh, Gallery neighborhood. At, at Gregorio Escalante, at Gregorio Gallery, Escalante, Escalante Chinatown, Gallery. Yeah. So it looks like it was a fun ride there. I, I, I got in that thing once and it was, it was hard enough just going to the market there. You know? Well, it, yeah, you can't see in this picture, but there's actually um, a huge uh, display case full of donuts on the back of the cart as well. Okay. And there's a bunch of fringe that would like move and sparkle. I recall. When you I got recall. up to speed. So, so now, yeah. So now this is like basically the peak of the art world, right? You're driving Kenny Scharf's golf cart. I mean, that's, well, I does mean, it get any better than that? I mean, in, as an experience, it was pretty fun. Yeah. But also. Uh, I have a kind of a specific thing with how uh, with Chunking Road, where you and Greg are next to each other, because when I used to write for Coagula in the mid '90s, I was also writing for Juxtapose, which was Greg. And now, and so now here I am, and you guys are next to each other, and I've known Kenny forever, and it, it's just this kind of amazing, um, like circle of life. Kind have of you moment. have you ever written about Kenny Scharf? Um, I honestly would have to check because you've written so much. I would have to. I would have to. You check. don't know, like like you've written so much. You don't know who you wrote about and who you didn't write. I mean, about. I know that there were a couple of things like um, the first time I was ever in his RV, that was down at um, a gallery that the artists uh, Dean Chamberlain and Stacy Vallis had um, on Abbott Kinney Boulevard for a while, and um, Kenny did a whole thing there, and the RV was outside and. I'm you might have written, sure about, yeah, but you, you might have, you that. might not have. Okay, okay, you know, I can relate. You've just done a lot. So, yeah. so how did you get your start? Um, okay, my origin story. Like, what what is your origin story? Um, I mean, basically, it's it's oddly linear. I mean, um, ever since I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. You know, it's like it's like that. It's um, it was sort of. Um, I spent a lot of time at the Museum of Modern Art when I was growing up. I felt, you grew up in New York. I grew up in New York, and my dad felt like that was a good place to take a tween, you know, like sophisticated but fun, whatever. And I weirdly fell in love with this Malevich painting, white square on white. And I just remember being like 13, 14, and being like, what the hell am I looking at? Like, how am I, you know, and it just really, you know, was one of those moments. We've all had them with different, different pieces. And in my quest to sort of figure out that painting, um, I ended up just becoming interested in that. And then art history was always going to be the thing. So then, you know, I picked a program, went to Vassar, it was the best one. I, that's the only school I applied to. Like, so you went there. to, you, had, you were an art history major at Vassar. Yes. And then during those four years, I sort of thought, okay, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to spend the day looking at, you know, paintings, looking at art and then go to dinner and argue with some people about the art that we saw, and then go home and make coffee and stay up super late writing about it. Like, that's how I like to spend my time. Is there a job like that? You know what I mean? <laughs> is there a job right? like that, Lisa? Yes, there, there is. Like that? And that doesn't involve teaching. Um, and, you know, it turns out there was, and then I just did your basic, like, you know, 10 year plan of, you know, starting out day jobs, increasingly fewer day jobs, writing becoming an increasingly um, salient part of my income stream. And then one day I was able to quit my last day job and just make it work. And then that's been, you know, the like 22 year arc of that. So, so in 22 years, you basically followed your bliss. You did the Joseph Campbell routine, right? <laughs> Um, I would never in a million years say that I followed <laughs> my bl bliss, did you say? Isn't that the... Blitz, isn't, blitz. Is it follows my modern bliss. Art blitz. But isn't, isn't that, there's some saying, follow your bliss? Yeah, I there don't know, is. but it just, it makes me want to vomit to hear you say that, Matt. Follow your bliss and the whole universe. Oh, I mean, just be off. Stop. <laughs> I mean, in the sense of, you know, I think that uh, I just... I got very lucky in a lot of a lot of different ways. One of which was knowing what I wanted to do with my life very early. 
um, so that you know I could kind of start with that. Um, one of which was um, moving to LA at a time when people in 1995, so, mm -hmm. so, when so, people in New York where I'm from thought that was the craziest bullshit ever. And now they're all here. But it turned out that I was like right in time to catch that amazing wave of like the late 90s that were still surfing. Well, and simultaneously, it was right before digital media took over everything. Uh -huh. So I had time, I had like 10 years to build a name and a reputation and a in body print. of work in print. in print. So that when digital started making the moves, they were still like paying writers. You know what I mean? You, they were, were looking for legit. As, yeah. So, but you know. Are they paying writers today? Well, they're paying me. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, like, I literally, if I had graduated college and started my career five years, or two, two years, years later than I did, years later. two years later, I already would be caught up. Like, I don't know what to tell young writers. So I feel that, you know, I was lucky in that I, I'm doing my dream job, but I also got lucky with my timing. You know, I just, I was old enough to be an authority when the web still needed that. And then I'm far enough along that no one tries to mess with me about, you so, know. I'm gonna I'm gonna quiz Lisa here. Hey Lisa, yes. this is pulled from Fa Shana's Facebook page. Look look oh at the monitor. God. What what is that? Do you know where she is? Do you know where that is? Look closely now. I know. Well, yeah. What's on your Facebook page? You better know. If if you don't know what's on your Facebook page, the, and there's a photo, is isn't it? Is it the Ames Brothers Studio? No. <laughs> Oh dear. I don't think they were brothers. Um, do you want me to say? Well, yes. Okay, yes. so it's the Broad. The Broad um, Museum. Um, less than a year, but a long time before it opened, maybe six months before it opened. Yeah, the cheese When it was still a hard hat area. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so. And they did a presser with like the mayor and everything. And so, so. Uh, that's the top floor of it. So. Uh, I still have my hard hat, it says the road on it. So, what, the reason I pulled this out, I wanted to show you get access to things a lot of people don't, correct? Yes. So, you got to go in the construction site, you had to wear a hard hat. I mean, they were seeking out the Broad yes. Museum, pretty much the pinnacle of the LA scene right now, was seeking out what you wanted right. to, you know, they wanted to make sure that you were in the good graces to know what's going on there. Yeah, they've been very nice to me there. Yeah. Um, but you, well, it's a funny thing about access because that's definitely true. And I mean, I have pictures of myself on a hard hat tour of the Getty when it was being built, you know, also, and stuff like when it was like columns and you had to sign like a release to walk wow. around. So there's definitely, but at the same time, so there's access and it's like, it's smaller and, you know, they pay more attention to you and it's earlier than the public, but then they super don't invite press to like the fancy opening night parties. Oh, no, yeah, no right? freebie dinners. So that's the trade-off. It's like, Lisa, I have, you, so like, how's you, get, you get invited to those, right? I have, you have. I mean, but, but like under the, different yeah. circumstances. Yeah, because yeah. we got wealthy, Friends Asians. in high places. Yeah. Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, I have a really good relationship with the people that, the wonderful people that work in the press offices at all the institutions. Mm -hmm. And if it meant something to me, and I called and said, listen, I, you know, I'm, I'm such, you know, so-and-so's biggest fan, and I would just be so freaking happy if I could just come to the, they would let me, because you, we have you, a good relationship. If you go to the well every time, you're not going to get it. Right, but if right. you go to the well, like the one artist that you really want to see, you're like, dude, can you right. give me a solid? You've got friends in yeah. town that do you and, a solid. Yeah. And they're great. And they all just switch companies. So even, you know, everyone works somewhere for like four years, and then they go from like the Hammer to LACMA or LACMA to MOCA. So I've known them all for decades. They just all keep moving, moving. to different museums. So we all know each other, and it's very collegial, and they're all really, without exception, want fantastic, mostly women. So, so. Um, but anyway, so there's access, and then there's access. You know what I mean? So, so, you know, having dinner with Eli Broad is a lot different than having the tour of his facility. Right. But it still is. You know, most most people in Los Angeles are going to go to the Broad a couple times, maybe once a year, or twice a year. Um, but you, on the other hand, how many times have you been to the Broad? Several. Several. And what's the other nice thing, though, about the media previews is you can take pictures. You're supposed to take pictures. Yeah. So the same piece of art with the same lighting setup, two days later, you're not allowed to take a picture of. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So, like, you know, all the, you know, in the Broad, they let you, but, like, how's your oh, worth? They weren't say. letting people take pictures how's on the opening day. No. But they did a media brunch the few days earlier, 
And it was like, knock yourself out, right? Because you're the press. Right, but it's just, so it's, but you know, at the same time, press or not, I'm basically Instagramming that. Uh -huh. So, you know. How many Instagram followers do you have? Um, like 3,300, I feel like. 3,300? About, yeah. And do you think it's a pretty elite list? Are your followers elite? <laughs> elite? I don't know. We're both for followers. I mean, <laughs> I've never thought about it. But one thing that I like about Instagram as opposed to Facebook, for example, is that if there's an artist in the middle of nowhere or something and I check their page out and I kind of dig it, following them on Instagram is very low investment, commitment, low, low commitment. commitment. Yeah, yeah. You know, where I don't necessarily want to go be friends with, you know, on Facebook yeah. and be all up in my shit. But like, you know, I might like their Facebook page, but Instagram, it's just like, oh, I'll follow you, like no big deal. And so I feel like that the network is actually a little broader uh -huh. and a little more different than the Facebook-based network, where it's somewhat based on people you might actually know. On Instagram, you can just love something and then it just comes through, you know, it's a lot. Um... So tell us about this news article about you. Museum introduces oh. judges for art show. Yeah, that was the Keep Lancaster Weird. Keep uh, Lancaster Weird? Hashtag that we started. Uh, yeah, well, Paige and I, Paige Weary and I were co-judges for the Lancaster Museum of Arts annual open call How was show. it? Well, did you keep that Lancaster weird? Yes. So that you got written up and this is from the Lancaster paper? Yes. I just pulled it off. Your, you've judged a lot of art shows in your time? Yes. What is the best part about judging uh, an art show? Um, Besides getting paid. <laughs> It was so bad I had to do and it. What up. is the hardest part? I think like let's do this as a two parter. The best part and the hardest part. Um well the hardest things are when you have some sort of like empathy or understanding of the artist and maybe their personal story or maybe you can see like what kind of personal emotional investment and meaning and you just know it's like super important to them but it's terrible uh -huh. <laughs> and then you're standing there right and you're like okay I don't want to hang that in the show but the damage to me for hanging it versus how amazing a moment it would be for this person for whatever reason and so it's very difficult because you 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 don't you know, you're not supposed to factor that in, but then in the context of a community involvement sort of thing, like a Lancaster, maybe you should be, you know what I mean? Where like they have a lot of teenagers who enter and you want every teenager to be encouraged to follow something that interests them. What enough, about right? old people? Or whatever it is. But I'm just saying like, so you go, oh my God, this guy's like 14. I'm not gonna be like, up oh, rejected. Where you go, oh my God, this guy's like 92. So I don't want to crush. So it's not a blind His last. Uh, well, I mean, it is and it isn't. You, you know, you kind of, every, every. Basically what you're saying is, is it's the, the hardest part is when the art's on the fence. Yeah. Is, is, is rejecting art that's on the fence. That yeah. would actually, would, cause, cause to you, it's like, I'm just, you're judging another show, but oh boy, right. yeah. But to them, right. it's like the most important right. thing that ever happened. Yeah, the but the best cool. part, what, what I love is, when you really do like discover something amazing you've never heard of before. Yeah. So it's not just that you see something great and then you're like, oh, well, because it's by Abel. I knew that, he's a good artist, His, this piece is good. No shock, it's more like when you find something and you go, oh my gosh, I'm in love with that. What the hell is that? Who's that person? And they come out of nowhere and you feel like that's what you're, those things are for. Speaking of Abel, so. looky there. Oh. This was at the uh, opening of his show at Coagula. It you can was. tell by the checkerboard floor, and uh, and look look at the, uh, the 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 grouping of artworks. This was just a couple days ago. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, so you're you're out and about. Yes. Is it is it better for you to re do, do you, when you review a show? Is it better to have gone to the gallery when it's empty, as opposed to when it's the opening? Do you get I mean, is it, does it not matter? Oh, yeah, or? no, it makes a huge difference. And um, I actually don't really like openings. And if I know ahead of time that I'm going to review a show, I'll just skip the opening knowing 
you know, that I have, you know, two weeks to go see it or that I'm going to be going to see it. Um, but I, uh, I, I mean, I enjoy them, but they're not helpful to me at my job beyond being able to sort of, at an opening, you can get enough of a sense of the work to know I'm going to write about this later or not. Uh -huh. But if you're going to write about it, you then have to go back when it's quiet. And how do you decide what you want to review? I mean, do you ha can you pick and choose? Have you like found artists that you just are dying to review no matter what? Or do you go through press? What, what is your discernment process for what you're going to review? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, be, well, here's the thing. It's another thing like that where um, every situation is a little bit different. Um, it, at some places like White Hot, where I'm the West Coast editor, I'm mm -hmm. the decider. Right. Right. Um, at some places, um, it's a conversation between you and an editor where they're like, okay, you're going to do one or two reviews for the next issue. What five would you most like to do? And then they put are putting their editorial calendar mm -hmm. together and balancing it according to their various factors. And they'll come back and say, of those five, these are my favorites. What? You know, or they'll send me something and go, you know, I don't know if this has come across your radar, but you know, I love this show. Would you be interested in covering it? Is, so there's every kind. Is of there thing. a type of art that you gets rejected by editors more often than not? Um, no, no. Well, first of all, I don't totally know because I don't really. The reasons that I get rejected are never quality of idea reasons. Okay, so you It's okay. like you have no way of knowing this, but you know, we the current issue that's about to come out has a feature on that gallery and we can't give it all the love two in a row. Or, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's math stuff. Like, oh, whatever, you know, too much coverage, good idea though. There's never been like, oh, that's insanely horrible work. Why did you even send that to me? None of that. None of that. It's always just math. So when so, things when thing when I when I don't do something. Is there is there um, a a type of review that 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 is is more appreciated by the editorial than you know? I would say that the thing that's hardest to get reviewed, always always is a group show. Wow. Because. You know, although, you know, at White Hot's entirely online and something when KCT at Artbound, I just, my John Outerbridge piece is 2,800 words because who cares? It's online. You can do what you want. But if you're dealing with print or, you know, something like the Creators Project where they have like a real template, you have 500 words. And if there's more than about three people in a show, there's just no room to explore and really sort of you know, get you into have to it. mention everyone and you then all of a to. sudden you can't mention anyone. Right, exactly. And so then you kind of get, you know, it just becomes harder and then you're kind of almost more critiquing the curation at that point even. And it's just a little bit different, it's a little bit messier. So that stuff almost never. Is this your favorite artist? Oh, oh. yeah. That's, I, I'm uh, gonna go with yeah. Is that Ed Moses? Now Ed's about to turn ninety. He did. He did. And he did. About two it weeks ago. It already happened. And there's the William Turner. Yeah, I think his birthday was like the seventh or the ninth or something like okay, that. Okay, so you've known Ed for as long as you've been in LA. Twenty years. Yeah. Twenty one years. Yeah. And uh, has has he changed at all, or is he this, has he always has he just gotten worse? I will <laughs> say there was a minute or better where he was a little crotchety, you know. And then a whole like second childhood happened. So the net result is he like has an age to day now because he bounced back from that, you know. The grumbly period? The, yeah, he bounced back from the grumbly period. And um, he's just full of uh, as much life and flirtatious, witty, do you, do you, you look know, at, caustic. Do you look at his art as emblematic of anything about LA? Is, he, is it too idiosyncratic or unique relative to, to, the, to the dialogue? Well, or? I was going to say the idiosyncrasy, I think, is something that LA audiences are a lot more tolerant of than New York audiences. So if you want to do a thing where you explore a style from beginning to end, and that may take a year or five years, and then you kind of feel like you did that. So then you change it up next time. And the work 
looks in, in some ways completely different or is about something else. And then you do that for a while. I think it's a very honest way of being. And then you go, oh, that thing I was doing 15 years ago, I'm thinking about that again. Let me have another look at that. And so you kind of stylistically might bounce around. Um, I think uh, LA people are more like, oh yeah, I get that. Oh, like it was time for something new. I get that, man. Whereas New York, you know, would be like, what the hell is this it's not, now? It's not, yeah, exactly. Right. It has to I, I fit in. I promised, yeah. you know, hard edge. Where's all the star coming from or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas here people go, oh my God, that's totally new. That's crazy. Look at that. And it, it's, you know, it's different. Here's the opposite of Ed Moses. Uh, that's, uh, you with, I actually with, don't know if that's completely true. With, with no, Robert I, Williams. I, would, I, would I think to they're say, more. And yet, yeah, and yet they're there's, quite. There's a lot of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a little well, crossover. There's also a lot of pictures in the world of me kissing Robert Williams on the cheek. Uh oh. So there's, you know, many. So, so, well, so. Because I've also known him for 21 years. So, so do you, so, uh, you, you get along obviously with Robert Williams. And I mean, yeah. Ed Moses is an abstract painter, whereas Robert Williams, uh, you know, the, the, the grandfather of the pop surreal lowbrow style, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what, I mean, is there, is there anything that the two of them kind of touch? Is there a point where they meet? Uh, God, that's a good question. I mean, I think that. Other than the, other than the point of meeting being Shana <laughs> Nace Jambrot. <laughs> Well, I think that um, yes and no, and it's a kind of another um, moment, like I said before, I think that, you know, um, Robert is equally as emblematic of the same kind of period of time in Los Angeles as Ed was of his. And so, you know, that's one of those things where those contradictions coexist in our culture so that you had the beach culture looking at light and abstraction and pattern and it's all kind of like partly zend out and partly right when, when and you then say, you had a more like say inland zen, or wait, south bay wait, kind of culture that was more wait, wait when you yeah. say zen you really just mean stoner okay yeah i'll go with that totally <laughs> okay. so you have the stoners at the beach making art about perception yeah right and then you have the like you know pabs blue ribbon you know, whatever, like hot rod guys inland in like North Hollywood, uh. you know, making cars and porn and whatever. And I think Robert is a kind of God to them. And you could make an argument that those two things are equally authentically emblematic of Los Angeles culture. And so I think, um, you know, that, I mean, you know, it, 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 almost like by their opposites, you know what I mean? They're almost like, so, Dr. X and Magneto, like you need them both. <laughs> so a hazard of the job, a hazard of the job of being yeah. one of the main writers on the Los Angeles art scene, one of the great hazards of the job is panel discussions. Yeah. So here you are on the, on the far corner over there, over there. There, there. there you are. There. So what's up with panel discussions? Oh yeah, right. I do them a lot, <laughs> like a lot, like yeah. alarmingly. What 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 is it about panel discussion? Why or why why not stand up comedy? It's, well, the way I do it, it's not entirely dissimilar. <laughs> and she admits it. <laughs> oh, I admit it. I have it on good authority, like that. I'm old. Like I I know for a fact I get invited to more than my fair share because I'm the funny one. Okay. I know this to be true. I've had it confirmed you know, by organizers where it's like, you know, these people, these people, and it's like, oh, we need somebody that's going to be like funny or entertaining or like, you know, and it's get her, like I'm that person. So, so do and you, I'm very happy with, with that. Do you, re, do you recall this panel discussion offhand? Um, yes, it was a year ago. So, well, it was at Photo LA 2015. Oh, wow. Yeah. You went to Photo LA. I didn't even know this many people attended that photo LA, so. Oh. Um, the uh -huh. panels had more attendance than the fair. Wow. The programming was like. The programming the was yeah. a central attraction mm -hmm. rather than the rent a booth. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, do you, so, do you go to a lot of art fairs? Uh, I go to more than I would like, which would ideally be zero. Ah. Um, but I also skip them on, a, on the regular. And what do you dislike about art fairs? Everything. Everything? I, if from my point of view as a writer, the only upside is the possibility of, for example, 
that's the only way I'm going to meet the lovely gentleman with the gallery from Istanbul, except for going to Istanbul, right? So to the degree to which there's, you know, something new to be discovered, that is convenient. You see art fairs as a networking possibility no. rather than like an aesthetic possibility. No, I don't, talk, I don't talk to anybody. I don't introduce myself as a writer or anything. I just go, oh, note to self that Istanbul gallery is fucking sweet and I'm going to get on their mailing list and when I eventually make my trip, I'm going to make sure. Like, it's more just for my own awareness. Okay. But there's nothing to review. Absolutely nothing to review. No, art critic has no role. I, right, and yeah, I get super agoraphobic and I don't drink and... The food I, sucks. Oh. So to me, it's sort of the art fair, I get it, and I'm, but I... Okay, but... I feel that the art fair... Uh, distills everything that I dislike the most about the art world and do my best to avoid in daily life into this like dense diamond nugget of everything I hate the most about the art world all at once. Do you have a worst panel discussion experience that you'd like to share without, you don't have to name where you were, you can be Switzerland, you can be neutral, but do you have like a good anecdote of like, that was the worst panel discussion like, like, have you ever, did they all walk out? I mean, did you walk out? I mean, is, has there ever just been a bad panel discussion? And you can allude to it, you know, I don't wanna, I would love for you to name names, but I'm not, I'm not gonna pressure you into that. No, I mean, I'm actually having trouble thinking of any. I mean, I always have a good time, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm gonna, you know what I mean? I entertain myself, like, if I have to, right? Uh -huh. So, I mean, I feel like there might have, I mean, God, no, nothing, nothing. Because I've had some, I've had some turkeys. There yeah, have been some no. turkeys out there. I mean, I feel like there's. Um, I wasn't on the panel in the one that was the most kind of weird. Uh oh, what happened? No, I just, I just, I felt like the people on the panel were like five white guys, and I freaked out uh, and uh, during the question and answer period about uh, that and whatever. But um, worst combo, five white guys. Well, it because I was like, are you serious? Like. You know, I'm listed, whatever. So I felt the need to sort of say something, but it, that actually turned out fine. It was a fine thing, and I'm not going to bust anyone because um, it's all. It was a long time ago, and it's like so water under the bridge. It's not even funny. But I would honestly say I've never had one that was worse than boring. Boring at the worst. Boring you know? is the worst. You know, panel discussions. I, I think they're essentially boring. No, but I mean, as opposed to like awkward or tense or, you know, heated in an uncomfortable way. Yeah. What does, Nothing like that. What bothers me at times about panel discussions is when you have six people in a row and each one says their set little thing and it's not a discussion. They each, everyone has their thesis. I'm so and so, blah, 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 yeah. next person. And it, it isn't a discussion. It's. It's monologues, and right. the discussion part is what's fascinating to me, and that exchange of ideas. I agree with that. I mean, it's part of the reason that, in general, I prefer to be a moderator than a panelist, because then I can do my thing that I do, which is go, I know stuff about each of you that you don't know about each other, and now I'm going to say, hey, did you realize you both, or blah, 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 have this in common? And then one of them will say, oh, you know, and now they're talking to each other. Exactly. And so when I'm, a, when I'm the moderator, I try to encourage that. So it can be somewhat frustrating when I'm just a guest, and it's really hard to, like, not jump in and be like, excuse me, I actually have a question, you know, because that's kind of my nature. But it's supposed to be a panel discussion, right. not panel monologues. Well, everyone, you know, needs a minute to introduce themselves. And if there's five of you right. and the thing's an hour, you know, you hope people are respectful of, you know, the time and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, as I say, when I'm, when I'm the moderator, I do my best to force them to talk to one another. So here's a picture of you. Oh, dear. From back in the day. Uh oh, oh Perry, what's that? So that's you and Perry Farrell, yeah, right? Wow. Yeah, it is. So tell us a story about meeting Perry Farrell here. Okay, well, um, the only reason this is hap that picture happened today is because it was April 21st, 2009, so Facebook was like, this is your memory, or whatever. I pulled and, it off of Facebook, I thought right, this was just I shared happened. it this morning because okay. I was like, oh, okay, that's a cool, so Perry, I've actually known since about 95 or 96. He's one of the first people I met when I moved here. 
And we were both living in Venice. We had a lot of friends in common and he was very social and outgoing. But I ended up uh, working on Lollapalooza in 97, which I think was the last year that they did the full national tour. After that, it started shrinking and now it's only Chicago, but he's still, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got the job of licensing visual art to decorate the concourse and the tents and the different things. So I worked on it with him because he was very committed to visual art being an integral part of the sort of... Way ahead of his time. Way ahead of his time, because that was 1995, and Lollapalooza had already been around, and it was always, um, you know, he always wanted that. That was always mm-hmm. really important to him. And he, there were different configurations of how that went. The year I did it, we just got all the JPEGs, and actually Robert Williams gave me a bunch, and we, we blew them up and printed them the images on the tents themselves right. so that there was no original art traveling and the tents themselves were made out of art the whole thing it was so cool it was so cool so um and then we just stayed friends in art world and you know everything and um then later in 2009 with uh, coachella happening um this uh, is at coachella that picture was taken at coachella in 2009 and I was interviewing him for a story on the visual art that was such a hefty part of what the Coachella vision always was, art and music. Mm-hmm. And uh, so his publicist or manager um, and wife and I conspired to write a fake name down as his last interview slot of the day on the press junket day and then surprised him that it was me, his old friend. Oh. It was very cute and so we talked for like an hour because we were done, you know, that was the plan. Because you were the last one of the day, so, the so it, was, it was more like chilling with you than it was exactly. doing a press But junket. then I did do the story, I mean, that was legit. What, what I was, was the story doing. for? For The Magazine. The Magazine? Yeah. What happened to The Magazine? I, I it don't just disappeared know. off the face of the earth. The end. The <laughs> she said that, not me. I didn't say a word, <laughs> you'll note. So, so what do you look at as your career triumph? You've had many. I mean, maybe, and a long list is impossible to remember compared to a short list. I know people that will walk up to you and tell you the great, the great thing they do, but you're on an airplane and you want to impress the person sitting next to you who's a complete stranger. So, so what as do you tell to them? ignore them and pretend they're yeah. not there, which what, is what, what I you, really do. What do you want your career triumph to be? Well, I mean, there's a couple of different... First of all, I'm only 44, so like, whoa, Hoss, you know, like, I have a minute to still kind of get there, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I will say that, um, I mean, there are artists that uh, I've interviewed and, you know, had access to that uh, have kind of blown my mind. So I interviewed Marina Abramovic, you know, David Lynch. I wrote Brandon Boyd's, you know, art book. Like I've worked with Vigo Mortensen and, and, you know, these are amazing, amazing people. Who Moby, who's become a, a dear friend and none of these necessarily would have been people that I as like an art critic would have had access to but when they come to a time where they want to explore their own visual creativity someone like me might get to jump the line a little bit because I also come from Lollapalooza and Flavor Pill and I have a little bit of a rock and roll thing going on with my early work so I'm kind of you know in juxtapose and everything like that so um, you know that's been you know, amazing in a sort of like, I wish I had a time machine. I could go back to high school and tell myself that was going to be cool. Like, it's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. Gonna be Someday cool. there's going to be a picture of you and David Lynch at his house on the internet. Like, relax. It's going to be go. fine. <laughs> so I love those things because I feel like those things reach into the popular culture and make what I do a little bit more accessible in that way. But then on the other hand, my mother, who loves me and supports me, um, when I was 35, she wrote me a birthday card. It was like, happy birthday, sweetheart. I'm still not totally clear on what you actually do, but I want you to know I'm very proud of you. <laughs> and then fast forward six years later, I get, I'm one of the very first writers hired on Artbound, right? And I tell this to my mom and her reaction was, I know what PBS is. I watch Art 21. Is it like that? And it's like, you know what? Yeah, there you go. And so that moment where, you know, I did something my mother had heard of and mm-hmm. was on board with. It's pretty mainstream. Yeah. Was very, but then also, you know, there's individual stories like um, the one that just came out a couple of days ago for, for Artbound on John Outerbridge, which unbelievably is one of like 
the very few existing pieces of sort of popular critical text on his work and a rare interview. He's not granting interviews and I got one. So that is, you know, the little art historian that I trained to be is nerding out on the John Outerbridge thing. Let's see how the artwork of you right. but anyway, has turned so, out. You know, there's different answers. You know, sorry. Let's see how the artwork of you, we only got 30 seconds oh, left. Oh, shoot. So let's. Oh, wow. you managed to imagine what I would look like when I wasn't talking. OK, <laughs> the mouth is closed. OK, that's, well, that's the... rare enough. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. OK. I dig it. Well, you know, this was an excellent episode uh, to, to actually. Modern Art Blitz. We're normally on Sundays. This was a Thursday episode. I had a blast. Me too. Thanks to our guest, Abel Alejandre, Shana Nice Dambrot, my lovely co host, Lisa Derrick. She got a few words in this episode. She did. <laughs> actually really so, and now, and now we're going to send this straight to uh, the Louvre or the MoMA. I don't know which, but uh, there well, we go. He's got some big money from Geffen so he can buy it. There we go. Woo! All right. Cue our theme song.